Hey listeners, Adam O'Donnell here. Today we have a special episode with one of the founding team members at Beats Audio, Omar Johnson. He goes behind the scenes on some of their best growth strategies that eventually led the company to be acquired by Apple for three billion. Our rules are pretty simple. Let's just look at the best in the world and let's try and beat them. From his time at Nike, he made the connection between music and sports and knew that there was something there. Back to John McEnroe, athletes were using headphones before sports, but no one really focused on it much. He planted the flag in the ground and said, we're to become the official pregame headphones of sports. 48 minutes of a basketball game, you can't really get any ear time there because Bose would pay for that time and they would brand block everything out. But cameras started focused on guys before the game. So they said, let's just go straight to the athletes, give them our product. Nobody owned that space. So I made it a point to go and dominate every pregame moment with our products. If I'm you, I'm like, great idea. Why didn't I think of that? This had been done before. They just did it better. There were a lot of companies who send boxes of headphones to athletes in locker rooms. But here's the issue. If they send a box of anything to anywhere, it doesn't feel very special. We were known for walking into a room with one or two pairs and giving it to a player. Sometimes we'd customize it. Sometimes we'd put their name on it. Sometimes we'd put a birthday, kid's birthday, a quote, a grandfather's quote before he passed. I mean, we did some really emotional stuff. This became one of their best channels and propelled Beats to another level. It's a great episode. You're going to love it. Hey, welcome to Sit Down Startup Founder Podcast. I'm your host, Adam O'Donnell, former founder and VC. I now work at Zendesk for Startups, where we offer six months free use of Zendesk for qualified high growth companies. Thank you so much. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to have you on the show and just would love to first just share when you joined Beats and what your role was in the early days. Okay. Um, so great. Thanks for having me. Um, when I first started Beats, I was the SVP of marketing, which didn't really mean much because there were three people in a company. So it's like being a president of like a group of three, right? So I was at a big title, but um, I was the SVP of marketing and hired to lead the marketing practice at Beats. I think it was more that that title was meant to lure me out of Nike. So they needed to give me a big title to get me out of Nike. Um, but um, I... Let's see. I, I, when I when I first started um, Beats, it was it was tiny. We were a president and a assistant and me. Um, so we were we were literally in a closet in the corner of Interscope Records. So I'm not sure if most people know, but Interscope Records was where Jimmy Iovine was working full time when he started Beats. And we were in a closet across the hall. I was literally in a, not a closet, but I was in a really small office um, that was like a closet across the hall when we started. And, um, you know, it, the, the magic of a, of a Jimmy Iovine is he knows what he wants and he's really clear. And he wanted someone who could bring Nike style marketing into this category and he chose me to do it. And... You know, I think where some leaders would engineer 50 people and a team and he's like, I'm going to get a guy. I'm going to get a guy that knows how to market and we're going to work together. I'm going to go build a brand. And that's kind of how it started. That is amazing. What was the original product of Beats? Was there a big pivot that happened from that point to where it is when it sold to Apple? Um, so look, I think the, the first product was a headphone and um it was a you know earlier version of what you see on people's heads today. I think what was interesting about that headphone was how different it was from the rest of the category. Everything in the category felt like dental equipment. It felt very silver, very gray, very you know um, it just it felt like equipment. And Beats bought an aesthetic to headphones, which felt softer, which felt smoother. And you know Jimmy laughs and he's like. I told him I want them to see the logo from across the street. And it sounds like a joke, but he meant it, right? And if you look at all the other headphone companies, they have these really subtle names that were really smart and they were always on the side, but Beats, you could see them from across the street. And, um, you know, think about product pivots. I mean, we, we, we learned how to be an electronics company. I learned how to be a CMO. I wasn't a CMO when I got to the company. Um, we learned how to be an electronics company. So when it came to new product development and colors and new launches and form factors, um, we learned how to do it. And, you know, our rules were pretty simple. We were like, look, let's just look at the best in the world and let's try and beat them. So, you know, it was a testament to 
I think sometimes you overthink, you know, big challenges and you're like, oh, it's the, we're walking into a new category. We just said, what does the best do? And we said, what's who does the best marketing? And it was like Nike and Apple. And we wanted to act like um, Dolby because they had a great licensing portfolio. And that's the slide we made. And if you look at the hires, you look at the team, you look at our style of marketing, like that's kind of what it looked like. It's pretty crazy. Clear vision in a category that was definitely owned by a single competitor, Bose, and yet you were able to differentiate on the marketing with the product. Um, yeah. I'm excited to hear some of those growth stories. Just for our timeline here, when was the company founded and when did you join it? I think it was founded in 2008 or nine, but that was when they made the first prototype. Um, they didn't really sell many of them. When they stood the company up was 2010 is when I started. Um, but the company had been around just as they were making product and developing it and designing it and refining designs. It took them a couple of years to do that. Um, but I joined when they were cranking it up to go and start selling. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So within the first year ish, you joined, uh, what was, so if we're from the moment you joined, maybe you could bring us into a point in time right before the first hockey stick moment. And one of the growth strategies that you did that was most impactful that led to that. Oh, oh, I'll give you a funny one. So um, if you think about headphones and music and marketing, um, you, you think about the playbook for marketing and you think of obvious things like the music industry and recording artists. Well, I started doing a few things. I built a plan. I started doing a few things with recording artists. And what was really interesting was I would do something cool and I would go back to Jimmy and he's like, oh, well, that guy owed me a favor or I did something else. And he's like, well, that's my friend. And I'm like, oh no, I got to find something that he can't do, right? And it wasn't that he couldn't do. It was just, I knew that I could, if I could find different focus, I could be really incremental because we would always do well in music. Like I, I was not worried about how well we do in music, but I also wanted to find a way to really establish myself as an executive. And all along the way at Nike, I'd spent a lot of time working on music and sports and how music powered sports performance. So it became an insight for Nike Plus, which was our product with Apple. It became an insight for a few other products that I worked on at Nike. So I knew it was there. And I also knew back to John McEnroe, athletes were using headphones before sports, but no one really had um, focused on it much. And I said, we're gonna become the official pregame headphone of sports. And it was, it, was, it was an interesting statement because, you know, pregame of what? Every game, right? Of sports, every sport. And in this time, which is call it 2010, 11, there was a huge glut for content because all the mobile manufacturers started to have more capable phones. And it was this huge, just people wanted more content. Um, this is when we were going to like 3G and everyone was promoting all the content you get access to and blah, 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 blah. So what was interesting for us is we had a huge opportunity because the, the 48 minutes of a basketball game, um, at the end of the day, it's great that you have that time. You can't really get any airtime there because Bose would pay for that time and they would brand block everything out. But cameras started focused on guys before the game in the locker rooms right, to sort of give more content to this huge sort of like machine that needed more content. And nobody owned that space. So I made it a point to go and dominate every pregame moment with our products. And we found smart ways to do it. You know, I think companies, we weren't the first to try it. There were a lot of companies who would send boxes of headphones to athletes in locker rooms. But here's the issue. If you send a box of anything to anywhere it doesn't feel very special doesn't feel very curated and typically i can tell you who takes it typically the guys who you know the towel guys and the trainers who take it if you just kind of drop it in the middle of the locker room we were known for walking into a room with one or two pairs and giving it to a player and that player felt proud sometimes we'd customize it sometimes we'd put their name on it sometimes we'd um, put a birthday kid's birthday a quote a grandfather's quote before he passed. I mean, we did some really emotional stuff um, to make those headphones more than headphones. And then those players will wear them with a lot of pride. So for us, um, it was 
taking advantage of an interesting context in business and content and playing in a category. Something I've discovered over my last 20 years of, of life, it's been typically people in technology and sports just tend to not mix, which is pretty interesting. And we made those two worlds come together like never before. And um, if you look back, you know, and roll all the tape, our biggest moments, our biggest hockey sticks were driven by sports, um, not music. So, you know, it's pretty shocking when you think about a company that's so connected to music and such a, so inspired by music. Um, a lot of what drove the success was sports. That is very interesting. Um, I've definitely seen a lot of athletes wearing beats, so it does make sense now, but help, help us go into the boardroom when you were first pitching, let's do sports versus something else. Help us around that decision you made. Uh, you know, look, uh, the one thing I'll always say about Jimmy Iveen is, you know, he always saw my talent and he never questioned it. As fast as I said it, he said, go. Um, and that's, it's a true testament to him as a leader and also someone that kind of just has great instinct. Um, so there was no pitch. There was no, I can, I'll give you an example of something I had to pitch that was almost a no, but um, you know, at the end of the day, it was so, like, he got it. The moment I said it and came out of his, my mouth, he got it. And that's how connected he was to what was happening in culture and what was happening in, in media and popular culture. Like it, he just did the math very quickly. So um, no, I, I never had to pitch it. And we did it. What I will tell you, it's we, I, I knew how to do the Michael Jordan band from the NBA trick. And it's a delicate one because you can get sued, right? And you can get in a lot of legal trouble um, if you get your products, you put your products in the wrong places at the wrong time. So for me, um, there's a few of those moments where you know, we got the cease and desist from the NFL or the NBA. And I had to walk into his office with those. Uh, now look, you know, look, 15, 20 years before, him and C. Dolores Tucker back and forth with hip hop and CDs and Eminem. And he had his own run-ins with like government and being banned. But I think this just felt like, why do we, we have this really special company? Why do we need to take those chances here? And um, he supported me um, nine times out of 10 to do it. And uh, we never really got in trouble because I knew the rules. I knew how far I could push on the rules without breaking them. And that's what always kept us in good sort of standings together. That's amazing. I love that he owned it. He, he understood it right away and didn't question you. What was it like in your own brain, I guess, at making that decision? Like why pick another industry? Why not? Like why sports? How are you so confident on that channel? Well, I'll tell you what was really in my brain, which is like, don't act this up, right? That, that's really what was in my brain. Like, don't, this, this could go really bad, right? Um, no, but look, I, sports, if you think about the entertainment genre and growth, I mean, sports has been on fire, right? It's just been bringing more and more people into it over the last 30, 40 years. So it's undeniable. Like, you don't, you don't have to look very far for like, okay, what genre is growing and what genre is contracting. Um, sports has been on fire, but again, a lot of electronic companies, I, I think it happened in high school. I think the jocks were over here hanging out. I think the engineers used to play Dungeons and Dragons and they kind of didn't hang out with the jocks. They didn't really get along. Now the engineers have all the money and they're like, you know, thumbing it in the face of all the sports guys. Cause now they're the cool guys and running around Silicon Valley. So I, it's my weird sort of analysis of what happened, but I, I'm just, always surprised to watch how allergic technology can be towards sports and again and it's a lot of it makes sense right engineers like black white very clear outcomes i'm going to spin x i'm going to get y well you know you're going back to golden state warriors well, this year who knows this year i mean they're doing amazing but like you go and you're back you know the milwaukee bucks you hope they're going to make it just that didn't compute for a lot of my friends in technology, right? They're like, you get it all, you get nothing. So, you know, I could see why sports hasn't always been super popular in technology, but my God, you know, once you, you, you activate um, technology in sports and you can see some pretty obnoxious things and it's something that the world all too often gives to Nike and says, oh, Nike's the best at it. Well, anybody can do what Nike does. Like, I love Nike, but I mean, at the end of the day, it's, they don't have a lock on the market on sports activation. 
Um, I, just, I wish more brands would look into sports as a way to activate their business. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. For you, it's just like a core understanding of that and just culture that you're like, this is more obvious. It sounded like the execution of doing it. Could you, could you tell us more about like the very first step and like maybe how you had to iterate if you did on becoming to get the momentum in, in sports? Yeah, look, I mean, it's a little less about, um, to me, iteration and more about setting clear objectives. And when you think about your company, finding an authentic place for your product in sports, and it doesn't have to be on a court. Like, that's, that's the, the miss everyone has. It's like, if I was focused on getting beats on the court, I would have been waiting four years for Bose to give up the license for the NBA. I didn't care about the court, right? And there's so many other courts besides the actual court where the game is played, right? So for us, um, we had to contextualize our product in sports. So we contextualized it in three ways. We said one, helps players focus, helps players block out noise, helps players get to, a lot of them use rhythm when they train and music when they train, helps them get back into that rhythm. And we just found interesting ways to tell the same story in different ways, right? And that's what was crazy about it. So here what you want um, is a really simple way to say noise cancellation. Most companies don't have the self-confidence to take something that's really technical and make it sound that simple. But when you look at the marketing messages that you remember, they're one and two syllable words. They're very simple, they're very clear, and you at most have to have a third grade education to understand them. And, you know, again, here what you want was a tagline that we probably rode for four years. People looked at beats as all this dynamic. We, we were dynamic, but we did a lot of the same things over and over in different contexts, in different sports. And I think it's how do you find that simple focus message, then find multiple ways to apply it. So you're never really doing a lot of different things. You're doing a lot of the same thing across different genres um, was our approach. And um, again, I think a lot of times when I watch companies approach sports, they're a bit too, you know, ambitious or they're really like the athlete has to say X, Y, and Z. I'll give you a perfect example. So a lot of times actors are great to do content and commercials. Influencers are great to do them also. Most athletes aren't great in front of the camera, is what it is. That's not what they get paid for. They don't get paid for peat lines, inflections. You know, this is not what they get paid for. They get paid to go and do things with their bodies that most people can't do, right? So we have to find ways to let the athlete be the athlete and also incorporate our message. So again, it's not just a, hey, make a decision to go into sports. There's how do we do it? How do we do it authentically? How do we do it in a way which we don't try and force people who don't act to act? Right? There's, a, there's a few actors, there's a few great actors who can, you know, like LeBron, he's a great actor and an athlete, but there's not many LeBrons, right? That can act and actually play ball at a really high level. So we found ourselves in moments, I remember being on set where we're, we had directors, we had to teach the directors, hey, talk to them about a game. Talk to them about a game scenario. You telling him he needs to be, you know, more somber, it's not going to work. You telling him, do you remember how you felt when you lost game five? And that's going to get the reaction you want. So, so much of how we executed our business was, you know, find that authenticity to how do we do it, not only honestly for ourselves, but also honestly to sports and honestly to the athletes. This is so good. And I, I'm just like comparing this to, a Bose mindset. Like I, I've actually, I'm, I am wearing Bose right now. So I am, I'm just going to be honest, <laughs> but, but I, I don't, I'm not connected to the product in the same way. And I think the emotional piece is what I'm hearing. I also didn't hear you going and competing with them based on features. And I think that that is like a lot of our listeners who are tech founders. It's so easy to be like, this is how we're better because of blah, blah, blah. As opposed to just like you skipped that and you, you didn't even play on that level. That's what I'm hearing. Yeah, 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 you're hearing that for real. Um, I told my team, I was like, we're, we're not competing with Bose, we're competing with Nike. If we're competing with Bose, I got to the category, the category was $700 million. You know, you know, you take 20, 30, 40%, I mean, great. You're still a, you know, $100, $200 million company. Um, we, we said we're competing with Nike. 
And when I left the category, the category went from 700 million to $10 billion, right? So we grew the category and so much of what we did, and I'll give you one more example of like how we, some, some early things we did was, you know, Bose was very much focused on airplanes. They had this ingenious thing. You walk to the store and they had the screen with the airplane and you put the headphones on and the sound went off and they were great at that, right? And, but they contextualized noise to planes. It's a great idea. It's a great marketing trick. But planes, you know, if you think about the people that can afford to buy a $300 accessory for flying, um, there's not many of those people on the planet. We recontextualize noise to be so much bigger. Kids in a room noise, your roommate's noise, fan noise, coworker noise, um, your ex-girlfriend noise. Like, Noise is such a big concept. And then we use these really statuesque, amazing looking people as walking billboards to show the world how to block out all these different, different kinds of noises. Um, so it's, it's the same word, it's the same concept, same technology, maybe not the same technology, obviously they're MIT or whatever they are in like, you know, but, but same concept of, from a technology perspective, which is we're gonna stop noise. But they were so focused and so myopic in this really small genre. And we just, how do we explode that definition well beyond it? And I watched to your point in technology, you tend to focus on speeds and feeds and the, the few things where you can usurp your competition. Sometimes we forget the true, like, where that puts us in the grand scheme of like the world. Um, we're thinking about our product, we're thinking about the category, but there's often a higher place for us. And when you look at the companies that have been successful, they were able to get out of their own way um, of the category or what they were doing and think big. And I think that's what I, I feel like Beats did really well. Um, we were able to get out of our own way and we never took ourselves too seriously. We never took, you know, tech, we never talked speeds and feeds. We never talked about how much noise cancellation. We just talked about, hear what you want, you know, block out noise. And the magical part is we realized that everybody had some sort of noise to block out. This has been amazing. My last question is as an executive at an early stage company, as pretty much a founder, what was your main superpower? Uh, whew, that was, that's an interesting one. Um, listening, listening and understanding um, that team, that growth was a function of this, not marketers all too often think it's about what we say and what we present and that company and that success. So back to the team, we, my team was 55% women. Now, if you think about the headphone category, when we got to the headphone category, it was 70% male, 30% female. And that's on a good day. That wasn't enough for me because I knew if we could bring more women into the category, what does that represent? growth. Well, we learned that 22% of the time that women were using headphones with no sound. They weren't using it for music. They were using it to send a signal. I don't want to be talked to right now. I am going here and where I'm on a bus or a train and I don't want any extra attention right now. And we were confident and comfortable enough to talk about that because we knew it was real where again, every headphone company was so focused on sound and music and decibels and all the stuff, the speeds and feeds, there was a real human behavior that they all missed that we took advantage of. And a big part of, you know, when you put a category goes from 700 million to 10 billion, you bring new people in. A lot of those new people were women. Simple things like making a headphone that's pink or turquoise or mauve or, and again, I've seen every headphone company make something that's pink. Great, right? Trink it and pink it. No, red, blue. We had Christian Louboutin red, okay? We had um, Colette blue, right? So for anyone who knows the world famous Colette, we, we found ways to make those product a fashion accessory. And it had nothing to do with just pink, right? Pink was a moment. 
but we did so many other things to connect that product with so many other parts of fashion and Fendi and brands. So again, a lot of that was listening. And if you don't listen, you don't get to those ideas. If it's a bunch of bros, black, white, you name it, same group of people in a room, you don't get to big ideas like that. And that was a big testament to our success. That's so good. This has been incredible. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I enjoyed it. That's a wrap. Thanks for listening. Make sure to subscribe on Apple, Spotify, and Google. If you want to learn more about Zendesk for Startups and our free offer, please check out our website at zendesk.com startups.